This is the first video of several on the concept of complex numbers. Before we get into what a complex number is, we need to review a couple facts that you are already familiar with. One fact is that the square of any real number is non-negative, which means for any real number x, x squared is greater than or equal to 0. 2 squared is 4, which is greater than or equal to 0. Negative 3 squared, the whole quantity squared, is a positive 9, which is greater than or equal to 0. So that's a fact you're already familiar with. Secondly, working the other way. We also know that the square root of a positive number is positive. The square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 16 is 4. We don't say the square root of 9 is negative 3. This symbol right here stands for the positive square root. Now, the square root of a negative is not real because there is no real number that can be squared to get a negative number. So that when we ask you to do the square root of negative 9, which you've said up to now is just non-real answer. And that's because there is no number squared that will give us negative 9. Now we're going to put this information together to come up with this new idea. And that is an imaginary number is this. The square root of negative 1 is defined to be i. The square root of negative 1 is no longer going to be called a non-real answer. It is now going to equal i, which stands for the imaginary unit. And where this comes from is this idea. If I give you this equation, x squared equals 4, you already know how to solve that. To undo the squared, you take the square root of both sides. And this is going to give us x equals plus or minus 2, because either one of those numbers squared would give us 4. And what you said before on this equation, when you took the square root of both sides, was that, nope, you can't do it because this is a non-real answer. Well, now we are coming up with an expression for this. The square root of negative 1 is i. So when you solve this kind of equation, it will be plus or minus i. I can't give you a physical or geometrical description of what i is. It is just this definition, the square root of negative 1 equals i. And one main reason we need that is so that we can solve these kind of equations. Now, using this fact and another fact you already know, the square root of negative a can be rewritten as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of a, because you already know something like the square root of 2 times the square root of 3 is the square root of 6. Basically, the square root of something times the square root of something equals the square root of the product. So I'm using that idea in reverse by breaking this down to the two pieces. And the reason I want to do that is the square root of negative 1 is i. So in place of this square root of negative 1, I'm going to put i. All of these can be simplified in that same manner. So take a look at the square root of negative 9. I'm going to first think of it as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 9. I know that the square root of negative 1 is i. I know the square root of 9 is 3. But this looks kind of goofy. We would rather have the coefficient in front and write it as 3i. Same thing on this one. Write it as the product of the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 25. The square root of negative 1 is the i that comes out. The square root of 25 is 5. Rewrite it as 5i. Now, do you really need to do all this rewriting? Well, that's up to you. Look at the square root of negative 16, and you realize, oh, that means there's an i that's going to come out. The square root of 16 is 4, and that's really all you have to do. Now, when it's something like this where there's going to be some simplifying, we'll still write it out. And then the square root of negative 1 is i. But the square root of 18 becomes 3 radical 2. And just to remind you where that comes from, if you take 18 and do a factor tree on it, we get 3, 3, and 2. There's a pair of 3s. That's why we had a 3 to come out and a 2 to stay in because it was unpaired. And then the order should be the coefficient, then the i, and then the radical 2. We don't want to put the i behind the radical because if you're sloppy, it looks like the i is inside the square root. So it's safer to put the i outside. Same procedure here. Write it as the product of the negative times 24. Square root of negative 1 is our i. Do your factor tree on 24. We had a pair of 2, so a 2 came out. We had a 2 and a 3 left over inside, which gives us this. Rewrite this and give us this. If there's a variable, it's still going to be the same procedure. I'm going to write it as the square root of negative 1 times the rest, which is the square root of 100x squared. And it just so happens this is a perfect square, so we have an i coming out. The square root of 100 is 10, and then the x, which we'll rewrite as 10ix. It would be okay to write it as 10xi. There's nothing special about that order, except for the fact that the coefficient should come first. Now, to actually get to the definition of a complex number, a complex number is a number that's in the form of a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. 
A is called the real part and B is called the imaginary part. So for this complex number, this is my real part, this is my imaginary part because it's the part that's got the I in it. Pretty obvious. But sometimes you have answers written like this. And before you can identify the real part and the imaginary part, you need to take this fraction and break it to two separate fractions. This is 3 over 5 plus the 8i over 5. And I wrote it as 8 fifths i rather than 8i over 5. Now you can see this is your real part and this is your imaginary part. Now we can do things with complex numbers like we've done with real numbers. We can add, subtract, multiply, and divide them. So adding and subtracting these, nothing fancy. You just want to collect your like terms. So you look at this. If you can collect your like terms in your head, just do it. If not, you may want to rewrite so that your like terms are next to each other. There's 3 and 4. There's 8i minus 2i, which is going to give us 7 plus 6i. Be careful here with the negative. The negative in front of this parenthesis is going to change some signs here so that when I rewrite it, this is 4 minus 2 and then negative 6i. A negative in front of a positive 3i turns into a negative. Put these like terms together. 4 minus 2 is 2 and negative 6 and a negative 3. Go to plus a negative if you want. Gives you negative 9. Same procedure here. Write out your like terms next to each other, distributing that negative. That's why that turned into a negative 2, and that's why this 3i is a negative. And then 14 minus 2 is 12, a negative 3i, and a negative 3i is a negative 6i. Last example, 8 minus 4. And in this case, we have a 2i and a negative 2i, which is cancel out, and we just get the real answer 4. So it's possible to add complex numbers and just get a real answer. This looks a little more complicated because of the radicals, but it's still the same idea. Here's one complex number, here's the other one. So what I want to do is rewrite so that my real parts are together. There's my real parts, that's that. And then rewrite your imaginary so they're next to each other. The first two are like terms in that they are both just numbers, but they can't be combined. All we'll end up doing is just rewriting those down here. We'll bring those down the way they are. Here, we notice there's an i in both terms, so what I'm going to do is factor i out of both of those. If you factor i out of 2i, you're left with a negative 2, because that is a negative 2i. Divide i out of here gives us radical 5. The only difference in what you're going to see on the next screen is instead of having i in the front, the i is going to be in the back. So that's that part coming down. This is the factorization where the i came out. And the reason we want the i in the back is that our complex number is of the form a plus bi, not a plus ib.